Hi, everyone. This is Jason Barack of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first-time guest. I've seen him, though, on RT Boom and Bust, and I've read his articles in the past on the Mises Institute website, though. He is Richard Ebeling. He is an American libertarian author and former president of the Foundation for Economic Education from 2003 to 2008. He's currently the BBNT Distinguished Professor of Ethics and Free Enterprise Leadership at the Citadel in South Carolina, and he has written and edited numerous books, including the Three volume selected writings of Ludwig von Mises, and his most recent works are Political Economy, Public Policy, and Monetary Economics, Ludwig von Mises, and the Austrian Tradition. Thank you for joining us here today, Richard. It's my pleasure to be with you and your listeners. Now, um, Richard, before we get into more sophisticated topics about the Austrian school, we do have some some newbies out there, some basic listeners who are starting to wake up. You know, they understand what they're being told by the mainstream media. A lot of it's wrong. It just doesn't make sense. So um, what are the main differences between the Keynesian uh, economic viewpoint, um, monetarism, and the Austrian school of economics? Well, the real distinction is between uh, Austrian analysis of uh, market processes, focusing on the actions, decisions, and interactions of individuals, and both the monetarists and the Keynesians, who are merely cousins within the general family of what's called macroeconomics. Uh, first, let me t- explain the Austrians a little bit and then contrast it with the macro approaches of Keynesians and monetarists. Uh, the Austrian school, for the listeners who may not be too av- uh, familiar with it, uh, originated in the 1870s with an Austrian economist named Karl Menger. Uh, he focused on analyzing, uh, explaining how markets work, how exchanges emerge, uh, the, the motives for uh, transactions and the role of prices in the economy by focusing on the circumstances of individuals, individuals who find that they have goals that they have in mind, but the means are insufficient to achieve their ends, and the logic by which the individuals would then make decisions on how, how to allocate uh, the resources at their own disposal, yet also discovered that there are opportunities of gains from trade with others uh, with whom they might find uh, uh, mutual benefits. Uh, He then proceeded to explain how trade emerges, uh, what determines the limits of how far individuals will trade with one and another based upon their subjective valuations of the specific goods that they possess relative to what they could acquire in trade with others. And from that, he explained uh, uh, the logic of supply and demand, uh, the the determination of what, what establishes a price to bring about a balance or a coordination between supply and demand. Um, and then beyond that, uh, he also focused that inseparable from these economic decisions and market interactions is the uh, the cloud of uncertainty. All decisions occur with the un- uncertain knowledge of what the future holds in store. All decisions are made through and in time. Uh, and that means that all hum- economic activities are occurring in time and through time, such as production, consumption, uh, decision making. Uh, and therefore, it is a microeconomic process analysis building up from the rationales, logic, and, and decisions of individuals. Uh, the, the, the macroeconomic approach really emerged uh, in the 1930s. Uh, it grew out of the Great Depression. Um, many economists found it very difficult to explain why the Great Depression had occurred, why it was so severe and so prolonged. And among the competing approaches of attempting to explain this rather terrible phenomena from people in terms of people's lives uh, was John Maynard Keynes. He was a uh, he was he taught at uh, Cambridge University uh, in London, in uh, in uh, Great Britain. Uh, He was a noted author, a literary critic and essayist. Uh, And he basically argued that uh, you have to ignore what occurs on those microeconomic individualistic uh, levels. And he said you have to focus on what's happening in the economy as a whole, total production, total employment, total demand, total supply, and not the prices of individual goods and services, but the price level of 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 goods and services as a whole. And he concluded that there can be this thing called a failure of demand. People may choose not to spend all of the income they earn. And if they choose not to spend all the income they earn, then the businesses, the goods to the market, will find that the revenues that they could earn will often be less than the cost of manufacturing they've incurred to bring those goods to market. And he said that uh, if costs, therefore, are exceeding uh, the aggregate demand of revenues to be earned, 
uh, businesses will cut back production, let workers off, and the economy will sink into a depression from which it will not have a self-correcting mechanism uh, through which to recover. Um, and this became the, the standard approach. Uh, there are reasons that uh, I, I think that it became the standard approach, far less with the logic of his economics, but, but the politics and the psychology of the time. Um, there were free market economists at that time who, who were trying to explain why the economy fell into a depression and why it was so severe. Uh, their approach, particularly the Austrian economists such as Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek, to name the two most prominent ones from that period, were arguing that the Great Depression was caused by monetary mismanagement. The Federal Reserve had been increasing the money supply, distorted interest rates uh, through this monetary expansion, had brought about an imbalance between investments undertaken with uh, new money created and the actual savings by income earners in the society. And eventually this imbalance between the attempt to invest more than savings could sustain in the economy snapped, bringing about the downturn of 1929 and 1930. Uh, they, then the economy fell into the severe depression. Economies have gone through downturns before. Why was this one so prolonged and severe? The Austrians said is that the new ingredient was that by the 1920s and 1930s, the degree of government intervention in the economy, uh, unions had great power to resist adjustments of wages from from boom level, uh, boom level heights to more realistic uh, post boom uh, supply and demand conditions for the services of labor. Businesses were operating with government assistance from monopolies and cartels. Governments were imposing trade restrictions, and it was these interferences with the ability of the market itself competitively to rebalance itself, the supply and demand of goods, the supply and demand for investment and savings, the supply and demand of labor to perform different tasks in different sectors of the economy. It was this government-led and special interest-induced resistance to adjustments to the economy at the microeconomic level that resulted in, in, this, in, in this prolongation of what historically was uh, the most severe depression of modern times. Keynes didn't want to talk about that. He came from an environment of the Great Britain of the 1920s and 1930s, where it was believed that unions had become so powerful and it was so politically desirable to help labor against business that uh, that wages unions should not be pressured to cut wages. And if you would try to, they would resist with strikes and maybe even violence. So if costs are too high because labor unions won't accommodate themselves to the actual market demand for labor, then have government spend money, either tr drawing down savings that some people may not be investing or printing money and pump up demand, push up prices until demand and prices are artificially pushed up through this inflationary process above the union demanded wage scales. So basically Keynes' solution, uh, analysis and solution to the Great Depression was inflation to raise the demand for goods and services to any height that would be f sufficient to cover the wage demands of unions who would not be accommodated to the real market conditions. Now uh, that became the prevailing view because of the political currents of the time in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the 1970s. Um, but with the 19, late 60s and especially the 1970s, there was this thing called stagflation. That is high unemployment with rising prices. So you had both recession and inflation. And this seemed to be an anomaly from the Keynesian point of view. If the economy was in a depression, well, you pump up and cause inflation. Uh, if the economy is, is, is full employment but suffering from price inflation, the government should you know, pull money out of the economy to dampen the price pressures. So what do you do when you have both inflation and recession with unemployment? And it seemed that, that the Keynesian analytical toolkit had no answer for this. Onto the stage came a different macroeconomic approach that had been developing in the 1950s um, out of the University of Chicago a branch of what became known as the Chicago School, uh, led specifically, though, of course, not exclusively by a very famous economist, Milton Friedman, Nobel Prize winner in 1976. Uh, and he argued that, that the Keynesian analysis was ignoring the role of prices, uh, of money, excuse me, as the uh, unstable uh, player in this. Uh, uh, government, uh, f f the Federal Reserve, the central bank, 
printed money caused a price inflation, and then that inflation became unsustainable and the economy fell into a recession. Now, that sounds like a version of half Austrian and, 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 and yet macro like Keynes. And in a sense, that's what Milton Friedman was trying to do. He was trying to be a market economist, yet accommodate himself to the Keynesian framework. So he, he, he believed that markets should be competitive and open, but he believed that the government should follow uh, monetary policy rules to increase the money supply at an average annual rate of 2% a year, 3% a year, um, to more or less match growth in the economy, which would also mean being accommodative to not really pressing unions to have to accept lower wages. In other words, you keep prices just rising at a moderate level through this monetary rule of 2 or 3% a year so that neither prices nor wages would ever have to adjust downwards to changing market conditions. So it's sort of like a, a monetary Keynesianism, if you will. Um, now, uh, in 1974, uh, the most prominent Austrian economist alive at that time, Friedrich Hayek, won the Nobel Prize. Um, and uh, after having sort of gone into an intellectual oblivion due to the triumph of Keynesian economics, because in the 1930s in the English speaking world, um, Hayek was basically the rival against the emerging Keynesian revolutions, a re re revolution as an opponent of Keynes himself in the England of that time. Uh, the winning the Nobel Pro Prize brought sort of a, a, a rediscovery of, of both Hayek and, and Austrian economics. And, and this is the revival that has resulted in the growth of an Austrian school. Uh, universities where you can study Austrian economics, a vast growth of books and monographs on Austrian economic themes, uh, several economics journals devoted to Austrian economics. And while it would be very far from saying Austrian economics is anywhere uh, near uh, the center of a mainstream, where it was almost non-existent in the 1950s and 1960s and into the 1970s, it has become a vibrant challenger uh, for understanding the nature of how the market works and what policies would be best to follow to allow markets to work uh, now into the 21st century. Now, um, Richard, the, the Keynesians seem to advocate enormous amounts of central planning and the monetarists seem to advocate less central planning, although, you know, they both seem to agree that, you know, they have to control the money supply and interest rates. Um, is, is that correct? Yes. Uh, in fairness to Keynes, right, you know, you, you can criticize him and challenge his views, but, you know, intellectually, you should be fair. It would be an exaggeration to say that he believed in socialist central planning. Uh, he did not. Uh, he believed that there was a role and a place for businessmen, the profit motive, uh, uh, the, the competition of businesses attempting to gain consumer uh, uh, sales and so on. But he believed that there was this macroeconomic problem, that the economy of, as a whole suffered from these periods of instability. And therefore, while you could have degrees of market competition and profit guiding decision making, the economy had the government had to sort of over, oversee the entire economy through fiscal policy of running deficits, managing the money supply, stimulating demand through government public works when necessary. So macro management and planning and microeconomic limited market competition. Uh, that, that would, given Keynes's views of that time, I think that would be a fair statement of his general outlook. Now, Milton Friedman came out of what's called the Chicago tradition uh, from the University of Chicago. Um, and that tradition always saw a great uh, efficacy and efficiency in markets. Markets are efficient. The profit motive works. Uh, incentives uh, drive people to do better. Uh, but at the same time, Friedman argued that, that, that for most of his career, that the monetary system could not be just left to market forces. Uh, it may be a rule of how the money supply should be managed, as opposed to the changing discretion that Keynes wanted the central monetary central planners to have. But he believed that the macro level of government had a place. Now, I, I should say, therefore, to be fair to Friedman as well, after he won the Nobel Prize um, in, in, in the 1980s, he wrote a series of articles where he basically almost recanted on a lot of his views. He said the idea of expecting that the central bank, the Federal Reserve, would ever follow a monetary rule, just increase the money supply 2%, 3% a year, sort of like an automatic pilot, never 
manipulated or, 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 or used to political advantage or purpose. He concluded in the 1960s that that was a pipe dream, that he was wrong about that, that, that any government agency, including the Federal Reserve, will always be open to political manipulate, manipulation to serve the short run purposes of politicians, bureaucrats and special interests. And he even went as far in another article from this period um, in, in saying that 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 uh, if if we, it would have been better in retrospect if the United States had remained on a gold standard. He was not calling for a return to a gold standard and non-governmental involvement in money. But he was saying that sort of with the eye of an economic historian, given everything that had happened in the 20th century with paper money manipulation and mismanagement, uh, if, if that had never occurred and America had stayed on a gold standard, the economy would have operated more efficiently and there would have been far less cost to digging gold out of the ground than the burden that inflation had imposed on society as a whole. That, that's very interesting, uh, Richard, because I was under the impression uh, – I know Mark Skousen, and he used to be really great friends with Milton Friedman, and he was brought up you know, stories about Milton Friedman to me, his discussions, and I've read some of Mark Skousen's books where he talks about his discussions with Milton Friedman. I was under the impression that Friedman hates gold – because of um, he basically you know blames uh, all of the U.S. being on a gold standard for a lot of what happened during the 29 depression. You know, as you know, you know Bernanke looked back towards Milton Friedman's analysis of what happened during the Great uh, of 1929 crash and what followed, and um, it's it's just really interesting. So it seems then that Friedman was kind of wavering on his views and changing back to that then. Yes, to different views. He wrote these two or three articles in scholarly economics journals. Uh, and around 1986-87, and uh, he, he basically said, that, uh, as I said, that, that it's ridiculous to think that the, that the central bank will ever manage the mo money supply to serve the interests of society with his idea of a rule, as opposed to being open to the discretionary demands of politicians with their short-run perspective. And that, again, he wasn't advocating the gold standard, but even, even, even in the sense of what happened, as he saw with the Great Depression, Looking over the, 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 the hundred years before he was writing this in the 1980s and everything that had happened after the First World War uh, with paper monies, he said in one of these articles that all things considered, the cost of the society, on the society would have been far less if the, if the country had stayed on a gold standard than the cost of, of, of all the distortions, waste and, and, mis, and, and, mis, and, mis, and imbalances that these waves of inflation had caused in America's history. That's, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. And um, FDR's Treasury Secretary, I think later, either in his biography or in some papers, he actually admitted, you know, the New Deal, all that massive definite, deficit spending. Maybe there was a couple, you know, infrastructure programs that were pretty good, but he admitted that in general it was a humongous failure. And after all the debt, and they spent, you know, a massive amount of debt, there was very little to show for it in the long term. Absolutely. Uh, more modern historians, historians, who have tried to uh, look at the New Deal years of the 1930s with a clearer, uh, more dispassionate eye than uh, many of the historians and economists of that time who were quite enraptured by activist government and particularly FDR, uh, they have, have concluded that, uh, that, that the policies that, that, that you often read in the high school or college history books – FDR saved America. He got America out of the depression. He, he, he saved uh, people from unemployment. The fact is that that's not the case. When he came into office in uh, early 1933, um, again, as measured by the government statisticians, uh, unemployment was approximately 25 percent of the labor force. Uh, as late as 1937 and 38, uh, unemployment was still hovering in the neighborhood of 15 percent. Uh, the the re, uh, industrial and agricultural recovery uh, really didn't even return to, to the full levels of the, quote, prosperous 1920s, unquote, uh, until the end of the 1930s and into the war years. And that, of course, the war years were itself artificial because that wasn't a, a normal economic recovery. When the government imposes central planning as part of World War II and directs everybody as to what they're going to do and what the prices and wages will be, well, that's a planned economy, not a healthy market economy. Uh, so, so all of the new evidence shows in terms of employment, output, balance in the economy, uh, everything that FDR did uh, was, a, was a disaster. 
yeah, I mean, the, it, it like maybe in the short term it looked really good and people felt good because, you know, they were not sitting at home uh, and they weren't allowing the prices to fall because, you know, you talked earlier in the interview about wages and prices. Um, I've studied a good amount of economics. I've read a good amount of economics textbooks. Uh, I mean, a good amount of Austrian school economics. And I think there's a really important uh, coordination there between wages and prices that the Keynesians just don't understand. You know, they want to they, uh, either they have political pressure from the politicians or the unions or special interest groups to manipulate the minimum wage or other wages higher. But if wages aren't naturally rising due to, you know, demand uh, for employment or a new type of uh, like computer programming, pro, uh, computer programming or robotics or new industry, then, you know, prices and wages have to be allowed to fall. And eventually, you know, they'll bottom out and clear out and the market will reach some type of equilibrium. I mean, the wages and prices are based on the laws of supply and demand, right? Correct. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a recent book uh, by a prominent uh, contrarian economist named James Grant. Uh, maybe some of the listeners have caught his opinion pieces occasionally, uh, either in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. But he has a new book called The Forgotten Depression, 1921, The Crash That Cured Itself. And the thesis of his book is that uh, the United States had gone through an inflationary boom during America's participation in the First World War. Uh, following the war, there was a slight post-war boom, but then the economy, the U.S. economy, fell into a rather severe uh, depression. Um, double-digit unemployment, double-digit fall of industrial uh, production and agriculture. Yet uh, this, re this depression was what economists call V-shaped. That is very steep down, but very steep up in short order, like within a year to a year and a half. And the reason for this is uh, the following factors. Um, one. Uh, wages and prices were not interfered with by government, so they were allowed to find their admittedly lower but natural new post-boom uh, supply and demand market levels. The other thing is, is that government cut spending and therefore uh, allowed resources to be freed up from government hands into the private sector for a post-boom recovery. And in addition, government cut taxes and cut taxes more than they cut spending, which means that they had a budget surplus, which they used partly to, uh, to draw down the debt that had accumulated as part of, it, part of its World War I uh, deficit spending. So contrary to the image you get today when you listen to politicians or many macroeconomists, uh, flexible wages and prices, competitive markets, cuts in government spending and taxes are the uh, proper method to assure a recovery from a, re a recession or a depression in the shortest period of time. Yeah, I'm very familiar with the Great Depression 1920. You know, it's not talked about in the mainstream, but Austrians talk about it all the time. And if we did allow things, it, things would be, you know, bad for a number of years. But, um, you know, we'd start off and people would adjust. The economy would adjust. People would learn to do more with less. Uh, wages and prices would both fall. I mean, people would be would be uh, rewarded for saving their money and not using as much credit. And I think that's something the Keynesians don't fully understand is that the, the and the Austrians understand this is that interest rates coordinate and regulate, you know, production, savings and consumption. The Keynesians just think, you know, that they can they can pull this lever or pull that lever and that they can get people to consume more or they can create a new type of a credit bubble or asset bubble or something like that. Correct. Uh, the, the core and most central error in their thinking um, is, is what Hayek has called the pretense of knowledge uh, or, or, the, or the hubris of, of the politician. And that is the presumption that they have enough knowledge, wisdom and ability to, to in detail micromanage an unbelievably intricate and complex and ever changing economy better than allowing people on the ground in their respective corners of the division of labor to be making their own plans, making their best decisions as they see the lay of the land uh, in, in, their, in their own situation and find ways to uh, find mutually agreeable terms of trade to direct production guided by the profits that they think they can earn through satisfying consumer demand and uh, allowing people to use their own knowledge in their own places in the society uh, and coordinate themselves through, through markets and prices uh, will be in the long run much more efficient, effective and, and balancing than to, to leave this to a hand of people in Washington, D.C. or a state capital who have the arrogance and hubris, as I said, to think that they can manage everything from the top down 
when they have neither the knowledge, wisdom, or ability to do so successfully, and if they attempt to, can only make things far worse than anything a market would have itself generated. That, that's a great point, Richard. And, you know, something I don't hear most people call on, especially the Wall Street people, is the track record of the, you know, the central bankers, the people that are making these policy decisions, the central planners. You know, they just have an absolute horrible track record. We've seen videos of Ben Bernanke saying there was no housing bubble right before, you know, everything started to hit the fan. And we've seen other examples of this. And yet, you know, they don't get called out. And what they do, Richard, uh, it seems, is that, you know, if they're printing $85 billion a month now, um, I, I guess they're slowing that down with the quantitative easing program maybe a little bit. But, you know, they're going to go back at some point and they're going to say, well, you know, we tried $45 billion a month. That didn't work. It wasn't enough. We tried $85 billion a month. Uh, that, uh, it wasn't enough. Um, you know, it seems to me, Richard, that sometime down the line, they're going to say we have to try $200 billion a month and that'll get it done. But I, I think it's going to fail as well. Well, the, the fundamental problem is that you see, you're right, is that what happens is, is that after, after every boom uh, is followed by a downturn, uh, they're forced to admit that they made errors, they didn't understand things, uh, there were omissions of, of policy on their part, but they assure us they're learning from their mistakes and that they'll get <laughs> it right next time. The problem is we've gone through a whole series of these next times, and each recession is either as bad as the last one or even sometimes worse. Uh, maybe the problem is it's not a matter of trying to learn from your mistakes, but that what they think they can do is beyond the human capacity. And that is one mind or a group of minds knowing enough to plan, coordinate and direct either directly through uh, commands or through monetary and fiscal policies to direct all of the activities of multitudes of millions of people in a changing and dynamic economy. It is better to leave it to individuals themselves and coordinate from the bottom up through the competitive price system. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And when I you know, try to argue with Keynesians, and I've argued with some PhD economists and a few people who used to work at the Fed, I met them through um, my contacts list. You know, what they tell me is, you know, if we if we had better models, everything would be all right. But, you know, there's um, it's, it's, it's exactly what you said. There's just no way that they can accurately plan to model so many different variables there. It's just there. There's just enormous hubris. There's no way they're going to be able to ever accurately model all these different variables. And it's just smarter to cut government spending and cut taxes and encourage savings and let, you know, the entrepreneur and the small businessman encourage job growth there and let them have their capital back and figure out how to, you know, create a new business and a new industry and things like that. Yes. Unfortunately, this is, this is uh, the, the psychology of, of the social engineer that has dominated society seemingly forever. Uh, Adam Smith, the famous Scottish economist, usually considered the father of economics, um, wrote a book, not his famous book, The Wealth of Nations, but an earlier one called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And there's a famous passage in it in which he talks about the man of system, which today we would call the government planner, the social engineer, who looks upon society as a great chessboard. And he wants to move the pawns on this chessboard into the directions and the positions and the relationships that he thinks is good, desirable, and aesthetically attractive. And what he forgets is that each of the pawns on that great chessboard of society is an individual human being with his own values, purposes, goals, dreams, and hopes. And that when he tries to move these people on the chessboard of society in opposition to how people themselves want to move about and form patterns and relationships on it, all that happens is disaster, uh, imbalance, distortion, and finally uh, breaks that bring about the types of things that we see with a recession or a depression. Now, um, going, going forward here, I, I think, you know, the, the Keynesians are trying to engineer another artificial boom, you know, after the bust in 2008. Uh, Austrians believe the, the bust is the cure for malinvestment and misallocation of capital. They also believe the boom was bad and artificial. Keynesians, you know, basically believe the opposite. They believe uh, the credit, any credit bubble, no matter what they do, I guess we, <laughs> according to Paul Krugman, Krugman, whether it's a war or an alien invasion is, is good. But um, do you think then the Keynesians are going to keep being allowed by the, the normal people and the people on Wall Street to, con to keep ma manipulating interest rates intentionally uh, and creating credit bubbles that they'll be able to mop up with more printed money going forward? Well, I think we need to remember that a lot of banks make huge sums of money in the short run with government created money. 
including using that created money to finance government debt from which they collect interest rates, even if it's modest interest rates. And that they have come to have confidence, particularly after the downturn of 08 and 09, that there's this thing called too big to fail. And that if uh, if they get it wrong, which of course they will, and if another downturn occurs, which is almost inevitable, uh, they don't have to worry. They've gained the short run benefits from central bank manipulation. And if they, they get out on a limb again, they can count on government uh, assisting them like they did a few years ago, because, well, you can't allow the banks to fail. Um, what will happen to the economy? They use that card, that fear card, if you will, uh, to justify it. So I don't think that many in the banking system, in the big boy network of it, uh, have any desire to see the Federal Reserve stop playing its games. They gain too much from it in the short run. And of course, the short run is followed by another short run and then a bailout from Washington. Yeah, those are great points. And there's the Cantillon effect, right, where the people in D.C., the people on Wall Street, they're making so much money off the, um, the this money printing, the quantitative easing programs. They're getting to, you know, do all kinds of uh, trades where they can borrow, they can use the collateral at the Fed and they can borrow it, uh, pledge it as collateral and then make, you know, hundreds of million dollar trades and yen carry trade that they're doing it in Japan with the yen and carry trades. So, um, you know, as long as they can keep Bit making enormous bonuses off of that, and most people aren't aware exactly what's happening, I think that they can keep getting away with it for quite a while longer. Unfortunately, I totally agree. That's the dilemma we're in. It requires a, 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 a philosophical and ideological and political shift in ideas. Uh, if I can refer to Hayek again, um, in 1949, he published an essay called The Intellectuals and Socialism. And he said that... Uh, it's easy to become impatient and to think that, why can't we just change the political direction today? But he said, you have to understand that the political currents that dominate actual economic policy here and now are the trends of, e of economic and political thinking that had its birth 30, 40 or 50 years earlier. They had to percolate through the society from the big thinkers to the intellectuals, to the media pundits, to the educators in schools, until it just becomes the taken for granted in society. Well, of course, government is supposed to do X, Y, and Z. And that uh, we have to have the, the long-term uh, confidence and, and willingness to do everything in our power to change the trend of ideas. Because until the trend of ideas are, are shifted into a better direction, we can never hope, admittedly somewhere down the road, not in the next presidential election, but somewhere down the road, a shift of actual policy towards a more free market and less interventionist path. I have two more questions before I let you go, Richard. Um, what would uh, Ludwig von Mises, uh, Friedrich Hayek, and Murray Rothbard be surprised that Keynesians have kept this fiat money game going for so long? No. No. All of them clearly understood that 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 – that politicians focus on the short run. Uh, it all goes back to what the famous French free market economist of the 19th century, Frederick Bastiat, said, what is seen and what is unseen. What is seen is when government prints money and spends it, when, when interest rates are artificially lowered and businesses seem to have more money to undertake investments with, or consumers have more paper money in their pockets to buy things with. That is what is seen. Well, happy days are here again. I have more profits, greater revenues. I have a job. Uh, what's wrong? But what is unseen is that these policies bring in their wake these types of distortions and imbalances that we spoke about earlier uh, that inevitably are unsustainable and will require a correction period. And uh, people, people are easily, unfortunately, focusing their attention on the short run uh, by the promises and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the magic elixirs that that politicians offer and not realize that, that, that there's dangers ahead. And we have to remind our fellow citizens, our fellow Americans, to, to look beyond the immediate and to understand that these things will put us on rocky shores again unless we move in a better direction as to how we think government should uh, be limited in society, individuals had, had, should have liberty to live their own lives, and individuals should be allowed to coordinate themselves through markets rather than through the heavy hand of government uh, planning or regulation. Yeah, I think it's going to be difficult from a political perspective for the politicians to allow, you know, the Austrian theory of the business cycle to fully play out where we get a 2008 or worse type of bust, which, you know, to the Austrians is the cure. 
Um, I, I just don't see that as politically feasible in this system right now where the politicians would uh, – they make so much money off the current system, off of lobbying and special interests once they leave uh, office. Uh, I just don't see them um, willing to give up uh, all those cushy perks uh, you know, and allowing the economy to, to correct itself, at least in the near term, until we start to change people's minds about you know, how the economy uh, should be allowed to, uh, to coordinate interest rates and allocate capital. Yes, I totally agree. But that is our task. If one cares about liberty, both for oneself, for one's family, for one's children, grandchildren, and to be honest, just as a benevolent attitude towards one's fellow human being, uh, it calls upon each of us, uh, admittedly with all the pressures and pulls of everyday life, to take an interest in being informed about what liberty is and how markets work and why it is important and why government needs to be limited. And each of our corners of society to try to uh, explain those ideas and, and, and in logical and persuasive ways win our neighbors and fellow countrymen over to it. Well, well said. Um, my final question to you, Richard, uh, what, what books should our listeners read to understand the Austrian theory of the business cycle? And uh, what are some of your favorite Austrian school of economics books in general? Well, OK, uh, obviously, uh, if one wants to, to read a fact book, but which explains Austrian economics from A to Z like a textbook, that would be Murray Rothbard's Man, Economy and State. Uh, an excellent book, of course, are several by Ludwig von Mises, his great work, Human Action, which is more demanding, but is very rewarding. Uh, there is also um, uh, several works by Friedrich Hayek, I would highly recommend The Road to Serfdom if you want to understand the origin and history behind the ideas have got, that have gotten us we are. Um, another little book by Mises that I greatly like, which is on the principles of freedom, is called Liberalism, by, of course, by which he, of course, meant classical liberalism of the 19th century, when liberalism meant individual liberty, free markets, and limited government. Um, uh, and, and uh, so I, I would think that if, if, if someone and on monetary matters, uh, there's an excellent little book by Murray Rothbard called What Has Government Done to Our Money? And since we talked about the Great Depression earlier, uh, there is certainly Rothbard's book, America's Great Depression, which is an Austrian analysis of the Fed policies of the 1920s and the misguided policies already of the Republican Herbert Hoover administration in the early 30s before Roosevelt became president. Um, and then if I can uh, be so immodest, <laughs> um, maybe there some listeners would find uh, some of my writings of interest. I have two books that on Austrian themes. Uh, one is called Austrian Economics and the Political Economy of Freedom. And the other is called Political Economy, Public Policy, and Monetary Economics, Ludwig von Mises and the Austrian Tradition. Both of those are available in uh, paperback editions. And I attempt to explain these Austrian ideas in a thorough, but I like to think a clear and easy to read ways. Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed your, our, our discussion here today, Richard. I think, I think I learned a lot about the history of where a lot of the modern day macroeconomists are coming from. I mean, I, I read Henry Hazlitt's um, Failure of the New Economics, where he goes line by line through Keynes's general theory. And, um, you know, most of the people, Richard, I think, who defend Keynes on Wall Street, I think most of them, un unfortunately, haven't even read the general theory. They just are they just quote whatever talking points the other people have quoted. I agree. It's not an easy book to read even on itself. Okay, well, um, I just want to thank you very much for your time, and um, you know, I really enjoy learning Austrian school economics. So I try to read, I try to read a new Austrian school economics book every couple months, uh, mixing in with my normal reading. I just, I just find it so intellectually stim stimulating because it's basically, you know, just common sense. Uh, a lot of it's just common sense. There's not a lot of crazy. Uh, I, I was in an MBA program before I dropped out, and a lot of the economics in there was just gobbledygook with math formulas and statistics, and it was just. It, it, a lot of it didn't make sense, and it was so confusing. And then after the 2008 crash, I told you this beforehand, before uh, when, when I first uh, started talking to you, um, you know, I was looking for answers about what happened to the economy and the Keynesian explanations I was getting on Wall Street, you know, on CNBC and Bloomberg. None of them made any sense to me. Well, the Austrian approach, if you take a little time to read it and understand it, does make everything intelligible. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, and. Have have you seen Ray Dalio's new credit cycle video? Because <laughs> have you have you seen that where he explains how the economy works now with credit cycles? No, I haven't watched that. No. 
Oh, uh, take take a look at that. It's like basically justification for you know all these uh, all these uh, credit bubbles that the Keynesians create, and then you know after one of them blows up, it's time for another. So um you know he's like the top hedge fund manager on Wall Street. He manages tens of billions of dollars, and um basically he wrote a paper recently uh, a couple years ago about the beautiful deleveraging and talking about you know uh, implementing financial repression, where basically the goal of the Keynesians and other central banks is to just keep manipulating interest rates. Uh, to zero or as low, close to zero along the yield curve as long as possible to try to uh, stimulate growth. Right. Okay. Well, um, please tell our listeners where uh, they can find your uh, your articles and uh, your other writings besides just your books. Yes. Uh, I write a weekly column. It appears on a news and commentary website called Epic Times. That's one word, epictimes.com. And if you uh, scroll down uh, to my picture, um, however scary that might be, uh, and you click on that, you'll come to an archive of my articles. And my new weekly article appears every Monday morning. Great. Well, um, I really enjoyed this discussion, and um, hopefully I'll be uh, be able to go buy some of those Austrian School Economics books and read more of them next time we talk. Uh, Thank you very much for your time today. My pleasure.